Welcome to Mysterious Universe, Season 31, Episode 12. Coming up on the show, we've got the Great Deception, the UFO Repair Hoax, and when your drunk uncle accidentally activates the alien quantum window. I'm your host, Benjamin Grundy. Joining me is Aaron Wright. Why is it always drunks? It's always someone who's drunk or high on drugs. They wander into a portal somewhere. They wake up in another reality. The kicker to the story is he isn't actually a drunk. He just pretends to be a drunk. Oh. Fantastic, epic, take your meds story coming up in plus. (laughs) See, this is your new category of stories. Take your meds category. Let me show you the cover. Quantum, Where? why isn't my finger where? Quantum Windows and Dimensions. A oh, Christian dear. Woman's Journey of Faith and ET Contact. It's by Rebecca Renfro, mm-hmm. who had a very successful um, theatre career. And it's one of those usual stories where, you know, something happened later in life, which I'll reveal coming up. That, you mean like a contact episode? Yeah, that, that triggered a bunch of memories. But one of the things she realised is that there was this uncle in the family. She just calls him Uncle H. And uh, he he was kind of the black sheep in the family. He had a... He was slightly taller than everyone else, had a weird walk about him, is very eccentric, and he never settled down and got married, never had kids. So he was kind of like a a bit of a Roma, and he would just stay at each family member's home for a few months and then move on to the next one, right? But everyone loved him. He was really good with the kids and a really friendly guy. And uh, she said wherever he went, though, he had this brown paper bag. And the whole family said, well, Uncle H is a bit of a, uh, uh, he's a bit of a drunk. He, he, that's where he keeps his liquor. And she said, well, I saw what was in the paper bag. When Uncle H came to see Rebecca, and this is when she's like 10 years old, he would reach into the bag and he didn't pull out a flask of liquor. She said he pulled out this strange curved metallic instrument, like in a curved piece of metal, she said. And on the end of it was some kind of weird contraption. And she has a real real difficulty describing what it is, but you get the sense it's some kind of exotic instrument, right? And he would take this out of the bag and he would walk down their driveway, you know, make sure no one was looking, and he would place this in a very specific spot in her garage. Right. Now, she claims when he would do this, the very next night, she would know that she needed to go to sleep with her clothes on. And she would wake up in the middle of the night and go to the backyard. And where this piece of metal was placed was the start, she said, of a strange wavy force field in their backyard. (laughs) She said it was like looking at moving silver water hovering in the air. She said it was 200 feet wide, about 50 feet high. And it was basically this huge giant quantum portal. (laughs) Now, she says... She would, you know, step through it like the movie Stargate and immediately she's in some kind of hangar bay and there's UFOs landing, there's American military personnel getting around, there's greys going around everywhere and it's the start of this, like, what the hell is this story dude, then? The, I was going through this book just going, this cannot get more bizarre. I was thinking the only way this can get more bizarre is if I turn the page and she's talking about the Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot. I shit you not, <laughs> 10 pages <laughs> later, I turn the page and there's a Bigfoot sketch and a freaking Loch Ness Monster sketch. Okay. All right. I'm in. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. I'll get through this regular part of the show as fast as possible because <laughs> I really want to get there. No, no, no. We won't do that. I want to jump into this. It's stuff. really crazy. It's really fun. Doesn't have any sense of coherence or any oh, uh, story do. with a, a purpose or meaning, but I have got just shotgun a shotgun loaded of insane stories coming up in plus. Okay, so you're going to be shooting us with hot chaff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, what have you got? Well, I'm going to go into a little bit of hot chaff myself, but this actually comes about because I've recently been thinking about the the UFO phenomenon. And uh, what I've been doing for some of our research is I've been diving into these really old magazines. And I've been cross, and they're, they're real thing. They're really, some of them are really, really uh, difficult to get through. And I just almost talk about being incoherent. Like they literally are incoherent. They jump all over the place. But there's been a couple that I've pulled out, and I've noticed there seems to be this recurring theme amongst them, which is so typical for the UFO phenomenon. We tend to think that, oh, you know, the the phenomenon, you, you kind of go through stages of flaps, like you'll have a flap of sources that people will see, and then you'll have triangles, and then you'll have greys showing up, and then you'll have contactees. And it appears, though, that much like fashion, everything old is new 
in the UFO field. It's like anything that pops up, which is new, and everyone all gets excited, and suddenly all this kind of attention goes to it. If you look back far enough, you find that this has occurred before. Well, it's even with the whole disclosure thing and uh, Congress yes. getting involved. Like you can go back to the 1970s and f- you read the UFO magazines from the 70s and it's the same kind of attitude where people are like, finally. We're almost there. We're there. Like it's the people are paying attention and the authorities are taking it seriously. And then you can wind back another 20 years and it's the same thing. Yeah. And according to numerous researchers, uh, there's some speculation that this is deliberately being done by the intelligence behind the phenomenon itself. It's deliberately doing this. And a great example came up only recently when we had, uh, and you and I obviously spoke about it on the show, it was that jellyfish footage that showed up. Uh, It was allegedly filmed at an American military base over Iraq. Uh, You controversially said that it was a smear on the screen. We We were were both wrong. It turned out to be a balloon. That's right. (laughs) Well, you're right. It was a balloon. You're right. You're right. Uh, You had people commenting, like Nick Pope, who has been around for a long time. He's been talking about this stuff. He commented and said, well, look, you know, this jellyfish-shaped UFO, it it, it possibly can be something which is consistent with what we see with UFOs because, you know, there's reports that not only is it you know, a balloon, like that's what some people are claiming. It actually changed colors. It traveled in different directions. And apparently at one point it ended up underwater. Mm. Uh, You know, this is suggesting that it's not just simply a balloon. I'm still very much skeptical about what it is. Uh, Didn't didn't you see the the guy that dug up, there was a tweet, a guy dug up the balloon you can buy from the local market that's exactly the same shape. It's like a birthday balloon and it's in Arabic writing, which is why it's that right. shape. I don't know of it's it, like but a mo- you hear about that. Yeah. So that's going I was like, it's highly likely to be a balloon. Um, but the thing is, right, the actual term jellyfish UFO, this has happened before, but it happened back in France during the 1950s UFO flap. There was, but it was far more elaborate in the 1950s. But this is a really good example of how this stuff seems to be cyclic and it seems to have a pattern to it. And of course, you know, you've got leading researchers, people like John Keel, uh, Amy Michelle, who I'm going to be going into some of his work a little bit, you know, later on the show, um, that very rapidly realized that there were patterns occurring across the phenomenon and when people were seeing things. And in fact, you could even potentially utilize these patterns to predict when there was going to be another sighting. Yeah, right. And that comes about from the French activities that occurred back in the 1950s. Um, oh, there, I see. There right. it is on the there screen there. Yeah, it look was at that. tweeted by Mick West and it was uh, it's the ID. a perfect match. Same shape. Makes, so Makes sense to me, but it's still everyone's like, are you kidding me? This is the Reddit thread. It's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> are you kidding me? As if that's what it is. Oh, that's Reddit. Yeah, so he'll move on from that. Uh, but the thing about this stuff is that, yeah, in that circumstance, it's highly likely to be a balloon. Um, but it doesn't avoid the fact that there does seem to be some weird pattern to this phenomenon that's going on. And, you know, um, John Keel himself, an Operation Trojan Horse, which I'll link to in the show notes so you can go and check it out. It's a classic book. It's, you know, very well known. Uh, But he points out that in early of 1967, after he'd been researching this topic for a while, he realized that the evidence for extraterrestrial origin was actually purely circumstantial. It doesn't seem to be ETs at all. There seems to be something else that's going on. He says, I'm I'm hesitant to describe what it is, but it seems to be perhaps a far more complex situation that's occurring. And he raises this because he says things like, look, when you take the research, and we know this really well, right? John Keel noticed that when you look at the incidents of reports of people interacting with UFOs, strange lights in the sky, anything that kind of fits into that field, humanoids, all those sorts of things, the highest incidence occurs on a Wednesday. For whatever reason, the activity seems to take place on a Wednesday. That's their day off. They're working all the other days. No, but th- but why? Like what? So they're just they're doing like keeping the what the fabric of the universe functioning. They're working the underground days. in their factories on the other days. Well, you know who else? Lauren Coleman then looked into this as well, and he's like, well, maybe there's something to this. And of course, Lauren Coleman focused more on monsters, but he looked at reports of uh, Bigfoot creatures and cryptozoological types of creatures, and he found that by far the most common day for someone to encounter something like that is a Friday. Like 30% of reports of people encountering these things happen on a Friday. Then on Mondays, like 20% of reports on Mondays. Why are they Fridays and Mondays? Why is it just before weekends? Is it just simply because weekends people are going away, so they might take the, the, the Friday off or the Monday off before they're about to you know, go into the wilderness, and then that's where they'll see something because they're going into the domain? Or is for whatever reason, are we being presented a pattern for researchers to analyze and to look at and to try to you know, determine or understand the riddle 
that is the entirety of this, this complex phenomenon, whether it's UFOs, cryptozoological creatures, who knows? So Amy Michelle, back in the 1950s, looked at these cases that were occurring across France. And, you know, with that, he found that there seemed to be some pattern to it that he referred to, uh, referred to as the authentic lines. So if you just bring up this image number one for me, please, Ben. So this so is a map of France. This is a map of France, right? So this is a collection of sightings that occurred uh, on September the 27th, 28th, and 29th in 1954. Uh, this really was a hotbed of activity that was occurring. Uh, I'll go into some of the reports in a moment of what people are, were seeing, but I just want to just show you this because when you look at these reports, you see that there are straight lines running between the phenomenon. And it appears that some of the uh, reports, and it will become more important later on because it's just one particular you know, section of time. When you expand out the phenomenon and you look at other sections of time, you find that you can map more of these events taking place. They always seem to follow this weird straight line. Now, of course, it's not directly a straight line. It's not like because the Earth has curvature to it and you know it's not exactly a straight line. But if you were to draw it as the crow flies... It is a straight line. Yeah, I mean, this is what the Kiwi researcher Bruce Cathy That's right, argued in lines. some of his books that these sightings followed what he called the harmonic grid. Yes. And his argument was that the propulsion systems of these craft must obey a certain uh, law about our, our Earth yes. that we ha- haven't quite discovered yet, which he was working on. That's what all these books were about. Right. And it's funny that you bring this up because in the full-on schizo content I've got coming up in Plus, the she, uh, <laughs> in the epilogue, she has an interview with the grey aliens. What? And they, yeah, and they say that um, part of the reason why they always interfere with nuclear detonations or they're are, there are keeping an eye on nukes is because whenever we detonate a nuke, it upsets the grid, the transportation grid. Oh, so it's kind of like whenever we're dropping our bombs or testing nuclear weapons, it's messing up their uh, subway lines. But <laughs> that all kind of falls apart though when they leave the Earth. Like, well, so- no, you, I mean, you, it's the idea is that you would have a grid, you would have a harmonic energy grid for every planetary body, and you'd have one for the solar system, you would have one for the galaxy, or and so on and so forth. They're not extraterrestrial. Uh yeah. Possibly. That's the other possibility is that they're somehow in, inhabiting, whether it's another dimension or some hidden realm here on Earth. And yes, us de- detonating nuclear weapons is disrupting that. I was more concerned with, is her drunk uncle actually her uncle? <laughs> what? Or is he something it's else? Some weird, like, Doc Brown. That's <laughs> cre- oh, I don't even want to go there. We'll find it later on. But look, when, when you look at this sort of stuff, right, uh, this guy, unfortunately, uh, Amy Michelle, he was quite heavily criticised for this, and if What's you start with the French and their names, I don't know. Why has he got two girls' names? I don't. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good. <laughs> Why is his name French. Amy it's, Michelle? It's very French. So he was quite heavily criticised because when you start looking at these maps, and in fact, if you bring up the second map here, Ben, mm-hmm. actually, no, but just before you go though, on this map, right, when you look down into, oh no, sorry, bring up the next one. It's the next map that comes up. So this, right, this particular map is known. <clears throat> As the spider. So we've got another map of France. Another map of France. Even more lines, and they form triangles. Well, they do form triangles. The triangles aren't necessarily important. So there's oh. also a trapezoid in there. There's a few trapezoids in there, in fact. But what this is about, this was a collection of uh, 67 reports that were um, correlated and were you know mapped to see where they all fall, right? So these lines that cross over each other, fascinatingly enough, they fall onto two points. There's one that's vitally important, but they all connect to an airfield about 150 miles southeast of of Paris, right? I was like, why? Like, why is it connecting with an airfield? Of course, you know, people could jump to the conclusion going, well, if it's an airfield, obviously these are human craft mm-hmm. that people are And this is the reason why they're following these lines is because they're all coming back to that particular location. That might be their base of operations. Makes sense, yeah. I don't necessarily think that's the case, especially when you consider, first of all, what I'm going to tell you in some of the examples. But secondly, uh, the craft that people are describing are beyond any technological capabilities that even we could have expected the, the black ops world to have pos- possessed in the 1950s in France. But the other thing is, the city that this lines up with is Ponce. Ponce in France, for whatever reason, seems to be the nexus point of this activity. And of course, what's Ponce associated with? It's associated with a huge amount of strange paranormal activity, UFO activity, 
uh, poltergeist occurrences, like very strange reports. Now, Michelle didn't really focus on that in too great a detail. He didn't go into that. The poor guy, unfortunately, though, has been slammed in the following years by, um, I guess, the it before Reddit existed, but the equivalent of online whinges claiming that, well, you know, by the 1960s, his theories fell apart. Mm-hmm. But they don't, right? And the reason why they don't necessarily fall apart is because utilizing this system that he built, he actually was able to potentially predict where the next sighting would happen. But guess what they noticed? They were able to tell the difference between what appeared to be genuine phenomenon and what appeared to be hoaxes. And the activity- Oh, by mapping it out. By mapping it out. Wow. So the stuff that was a hoax or more likely to be be a hoax didn't align along these maps. Now, of course, people started to understand and hear these stories. So then some people tried to put it along these lines, but it was very difficult. The reality was, is that most of the allegedly true activity that was taking place always happened along these lines. And it always seemed to line up across these strange, I guess grids is a term that you could utilize. But why? Like, Do they correspond with ley lines in any way? No. See, none of that's raised. Like, there's no, like, you've got like Paul Devereaux with earth lights and all that kind of stuff. None of that comes up in his research. He's very much a matter of fact kind of guy of going, look, I've looked at these reports. I can draw straight lines between them. And people have got, oh, well, these are corridors. No, they're not corridors. So with a corridor, you like have a flight corridor, right? So you've got planes that are traveling through. That corridor might be five miles wide. So it might be, you know, you've got one plane here, one plane there, and there's five miles between them and they're flying along this corridor. These aren't corridors. These are almost completely direct lines that you will find one craft come over and then another craft will come over and then another. So very little fluctuation. Very little fluctuation. And what is even more fascinating about this is that when you start looking at these reports, and even though you've got a larger time frame, even though much of his research was focusing on 1954 through to 1957, if you start looking at reports from 1954 and then you look at the later years of the, the flap that was occurring, you have it that you'll have this one line and the one line will have a saucer fly over it. Like it'll just be a, a standard kind of saucer that we know today. Then you'll have some weird flaming orb fly over the top of it two years later. Then three years later, you'll have some other craft, like a triangle, fly over it. They're different craft, but they follow the exact same line. Why? Like, it does is it going back to what you were describing? Yeah, before, I mean, you go back to Bruce Cathy, and it's like the craft need those corridors to operate, or those paths to operate. They cannot fly, or they cannot maneuver very well beyond them. Yeah, I, I think personally, this fits uh, this greater theme of the phenomenon, the intelligence of the phenomenon, attempting to interact with us. Because something that John Keel said is that oh, actually, no, it was Michelle that said it. And I, I wrote this down. He said that uh, the contact is being deliberately avoided. However, it's important to note that contact is very real, but remains invisible. Almost like it's this occult knowledge. It's hidden knowledge for certain people to unlock. And it feels like that's what the whole entirety of this phenomenon is, is that people have to look. People, We're not going to be given the answers. We have to start pulling those answers or the, pulling the details out and finding, well, what's the conclusion? And that's what you've done for us on the show today. To a point. To a point. So John Keel uh, in Operation Trojan Horse mentioned something that he says, look, I started to feel that there was something odd going on. And I call these things negative factors because these negative factors uh, seem to be undermining the experiences that people are, are having when they're experiencing UFOs. So this is really important. I guess it's it's much like what we're hearing in the most recent disclosure things. You've got military men, people that are supposed to be respected, you know, esteemed members of their community, people coming forward saying, I've seen this stuff or I've encountered this stuff or I have knowledge of this stuff. They're still allegedly respectable people. And yet overall, no one's really listening to them for the most part, right? But if you look, there seems to be this kind of stereotypical attitude towards UFOs that, oh, crazy people see them, drunks see them, rednecks and hicks see them. But that's not the case. That's not the case at all. If you look, you just find that it's respected members of the community, it's politicians, although that's not so respected, but it's mayors and it's you know uh, firemen and police officers and people that are not prone to using drugs and drinking and having all these problems. They're res- and it goes all the way back to the 1950s. And that was what was most occurrent um, in the 1950s is that it was just farmers that were well-respected by their community. They've never dabbled in anything like this before. Uh, and yet they had sources that were landing on their properties and doing strange things to their cattle, like it all kind of kicked off. So John Keel, on top of negative factors, he also referred to this, and this is when I, was, I came across this in an old Anomaly magazine. He details something known as the diversions. And he says, look, a large part of the UFO phenomenon is deliberately deceptive. 
This goes as far back as 1892, where it was common practice for UFOs to leave behind debris. But you know what they leave behind? They leave behind newspapers, pieces of metal, articles of ordinary clothing, uh, <laughs> mundane chemicals, <laughs> and investigators who have got these objects. Right? They've found they've gone out to see a witness who's reporting something, and they've been handed newspaper. But there's always something off, right? So the newspaper is not the same newspaper that was manufactured from an actual newspaper. Well, so it's newspaper with actual print on it. Like yeah. you can read the yeah. print. Yeah, and it looks like it looks like a proper newspaper, but there's always something odd. It's like it will be the paper's just a little bit strange. Or uh it'll or the, the ink. The ink will rub off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's just the kind of thing. Um, you know, there was a report with the French, right? There was a French guy that was having experiences in this flap of nineteen fifty two to nineteen fifty seven. Uh, strange activity was taking place on his farm. There were sources landing, they were leaving holes in the ground. Um, but what was happening is the holes were very rapidly disappearing. And so he would go and get someone to report it, and they would come back and they're gone. Uh, and then he realized that a lot of the times that the UFOs were coming down and hovering over his field they wouldn't entirely land. They'd just kind of hover there and they'd sit on this bluish kind of mist, which mm. is recurrent in these themes as well. Uh, so you can't go, oh, the guy's making it up when you know it's not being reported in the newspapers and yet you find other reports of going, oh, this saucer flew over my house and it left a trail of some weird you know, bluish mist that was coming by. Um, but what happened with him was that he eventually encountered humanoids on his property. And these humanoids, um, he went up to one of them and he tried to grab one of them. It was, and they're wearing helmets. All these these aliens in the 1950s flap, they're wearing helmets that are described as being like a skull cap without anything covering the ears. And so he grabbed one of them. He grabbed one of them by the arm. And the guy, the alien, slipped away really easily because he released like a moth-like powder. You know, moths have like that powder on the back, <laughs> but it was green. And it pulled it just immediately just pulled it away. And he was left with this green stain on his hand. Uh, it was analyzed and it was found to be a mundane chemical, just a mundane material. So it could be like this guy's hoaxing it. He's hoaxing it because it's just any you could get it anywhere. Um, but you know, John Keel says, look, I believe that you know there's many investigators who've encountered such phenomenon. They have been uh deliberately mis- misled to believe that this was some kind of human hoax or a prank of some kind. A really great example, and he says this is very common, a really common example of uh UFO activity where it seems like it must be, you know, people faking it as it's a standard human vehicle, particularly in the 1950s, 1960s was that people would find ordinary um, tire tracks in just in a field. Like there'd be tire tracks in a field. The problem was there would be no way that you would be able to get access to that field with a conventional vehicle. So how is it that there are these tire tracks? And of course, the tire tracks don't match any type of conventional or contemporary tires for the time. Just none of it makes sense. It's always just a little bit off, but it's enough to create this feeling of hoaxing or deception in other witnesses' minds or other people's minds. So people look like they're crazy. And that's what happens. This is why the phenomenon somehow remains elusive because people keep on getting So you're, you're arguing that nothing's changed and that the recent discoveries, no. the recent information coming out is just more of what we were seeing yep. 50 years ago. Yeah, pretty much. You know, 70 years ago now. Yeah, it's. I think it's exactly what's going. It's a, it's the same thing that's occurring. Um, but l- let me give you some examples, you know, before we get into it. So when I went through, uh, of course, the reports from the 1950s, particularly from uh, Michelle's book, it all started uh, back in 1954. This was uh, August 22nd, when it, the uh, the recurrent theme. It's fascinating because we were only just talking about um, dirigibles. You know, these kind of craft airships. look like airships. Uh, but they all had this cylinder-like appearance to them. That's exactly what happened in France. Most of the craft, with the exception of a few, what people were seeing were cylinders. They, were, they weren't airships. They weren't as elaborate as airships um, because the people could tell the difference because normally with the airship sightings, there was like some type of basket hanging underneath them or some type of you know apparatus and propellers attached to them. Uh, these things were very much streamlined, sleek cylinders. But all of them, oh, I shouldn't say all of them, but many of them have a recurring theme. Many of them glowed red. And many of them, uh, when they traveled, they would leave behind a bluish hue vapor. Same thing. So yeah, of course, you do have local newspapers that might be reporting on this and people may be reading it, but there were just so many people at the time that were seeing this stuff and were reporting it to uh, the authorities. Who's the guy that we interviewed on the show that was a former uh, NASA employee? He spoke about the same thing. Remember he had a UFO sighting? He was at McDonald's. Yes. Remember that? And it, yes. One of his conclusions was when he was analyzing all these sightings and even his own sighting was this um, 
purple or bluish haze that was left behind in a lot of the sightings or even enveloping the craft in a lot of the sightings. Yep. And then he extrapolated that into perhaps the type of propulsion system and tied it into you know physics research yep. that talks well, like about- like the ionization of the air. Yeah, it talks about plasma and I can't remember the precise Look, details. That, that's all um, a distinct possibility of what could be occurring here. I think with this particular flap though, each flap has its own signature to it. And I know it's really cliche, but it's like the saying of, um, you know, history never repeats, but it certainly does rhyme. And I think that's what's happening in a lot of these cases is that you have a sudden explosion of activity uh, and it has some type of signature attached to it. And then it reoccurs later on, but it's slightly different. The signature of the phenomenon is different. Uh, so with this particular case, it started back in August the 22nd, 1954. Uh, you have this uh, young man by the name of Monsieur Bernard Messere. And uh, he claimed that he saw uh, some luminous uh, cigar-shaped craft uh, appear over his his homestead. When it appeared over his homestead, uh, it got his attention. Well, he somehow it knew, right? It started flying straight towards him. As it was flying straight towards him, it flew up over the top and then disappeared. But it dropped as it flew over some type of luminous saucer. Like it left behind some type of weird su- uh, luminous saucer that went and flew over the river and was seemingly doing something over the river. Now, the following day, he reported it, and expecting people to kind of think that he was crazy, or you know, perhaps this was military activity of some kind, uh, the two policemen that he reported it to, well, they said, well, we'd been making rounds in this area, and we observed exactly the same phenomena. They saw the same thing. So the very first incident that kicked off the 1950s French UFO flap was validated by you know, people that are members of the police force. Mm-hmm. So that kind of makes out that there's something important going on here. Just three weeks later, Tuesday, September the 14th, 1954, 250 miles southwest of Paris in the villages of Verdi, there was a witness by the name of George Fonten. Now, he reported luminous, blue, violent, rigid clouds that were hanging around. Like he said, it was a rigid cloud until he realized that it wasn't a cloud. It was some type of gigantic machine that was surrounded by this blue mist. Behind it, it left a vapor trail. Uh, and he even said this is what was funny about it. He didn't know about the report from Miseray earlier. He said that it was like in the uh, trail, some type of invisible shuttle was set falling free from it. So it fell out of the vapor trail. The previous report, the guy said that it dropped some type of saucer-shaped craft and it went over to the river. Are they, are they dropping things off? Is, there, is it for some type of exploration? Supplying is- the ground team. Maybe, right? But there is something to that in a report that I've got coming up later on from Scotland. Where You've got 10 videos coming up later on, not to say that these 1950 reports of French clouds aren't riveting, but what are these videos? You okay, so claimed? these videos actually set the scene for a lot of what was going on. Um, let's actually, what we'll do, what we'll do, let's go into Malcolm Robinson. So I'll, I'll come back to this because this is quite important, right? Because with all these reports of what people were seeing and and the connections between them, uh, so many people at the time are coming forward saying they're hoaxes, they're made up, you know, people are, you know, imagining this stuff. But there were hundreds, if not thousands of witnesses of people that were seeing this stuff. Yeah, there may have been one or two that might have been, you know, hoaxes. But then you've got Michelle's work years later Mm. validating that, look, these particular events, they all occurred along these lines. The ones that are seemingly hoaxes, the ones that appear outside these lines. So I have to bring you to the Falkland Hill UFO encounter. And this happened back in September of uh, 1966, but this happened in Scotland. But we're still in Europe, like we're still in the the area. But the reason why I raise this is because it appears to be quite conventional. It just appears as a normal kind of case, but then it has some very, very strange elements that are just not consistent with this UFO phenomenon. But what it is consistent with is what you hinted to there before, Ben, with the French cases, is that... Is there already a ground presence of these humanoids, these beings, and they're being resupplied by something? Is that what's occurring? And of course, if 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 that is indeed what's occurring, as absurd as it sounds, well, you need logistics, you need workers, you need people to. Apparently, all this happened in Scotland. So I'm going to bring you to the work or the research of uh, Malcolm Robinson, who actually wrote a detailed book about this, which I'll link to in the show notes uh, at mysteriousuniverse.org. Um, but essentially, this is 1996, the one I this is, on the screen. Yeah, that's right. So his book is The Falkland Hill UFO Incident. Um, but essentially, he d- it describes the experience of September the 23rd, 1966. It was roughly eight o'clock in the evening. Um, it was Mary, her 10 year old son, Peter, her friend, Jane, and their 14 year old daughter. Oh, sorry, her 14 year old daughter, Susan. Susan wasn't there, right? Susan stayed back at the house. But I'll let 
Malcolm describe or set up the scene of what occurred. So just play it. Yeah. No, no, don't play that one point. Please play number six. The mother and uh, our son and a family friend, another female friend, had left uh, their house to drive into a small village called Fruki in Fife to get a jar of coffee. They had run out of coffee and the journey wasn't that long. Now that area, again, in question, Chris, is all farmland, it's fields and it's forests. It's very rural. Very, very rural, yeah. And uh, it's not a built-up area in any manner or means, uh, apart from the small village of Fruki. And they were driving down there, it was late at night, um, and uh, as they were driving down the road, they became aware of this black triangular-shaped object hovering in the sky. Now, what happened next was like something out of a Steven Spielberg movie, and I know it it sounds so bizarre. They claim that this object then emitted three columns of tubular white light from the underside of this object, and it was like a spiral dance, if you like, of three tubular lights moving onto the road surface. And they're looking at this, and they cannot believe what they're seeing. And then suddenly, the, this tri- triangular-shaped craft tilted slowly, and you could see a dome-shaped part on, on the top of it, on the top surface. And then seconds later, this object just screamed off into the sky and was gone in a matter of seconds. It left the witnesses confused, alarmed, frightened. A whole range of emotions went through their, through their being. They just didn't know what they had seen. So initially, what appears to be it's a standard UFO experience. You know, they're driving along a road, it's late in the evening or later in the evening, and they see some type of craft. There's nothing that terrifying about it, except for like... Yeah, that was pretty stock standard. I like it where he's like, now this might sound crazy, but there were some <laughs> lights that came on, out of it. Well, the beams are a little bit different. And uh, in the, the book, actually, he specifies exactly what it was like. It was more like uh, these beams that were in a field next to them. And that's what got their attention. And then they moved over. And we have, you know, heard reports of strange light activity that comes from this stuff. In fact, John Keel looked into this with the flashes. Do you recall the stories of the uh, the phantom photographers? So people were reporting that they yeah, were- Yeah, these weird men in black would show up, snap a photo, and then disappear. <laughs> but it'd be like a Favor Flav equivalent of a camera, like this yeah. massive round like flash, yeah. and it'd be always out of and date. It, it was intimidating. It wasn't really that they were trying to be stealthy and snap a quick photo. It was to intimidate. It was That's like, right. here I am to photograph you. Well, you know what this crosses over into? This actually starts crossing over into- um, what is happening to the occupants of the vehicle or the witnesses, because this crosses into, and this is identified in, in Michelle's work, was that there's flashes often associated with with UFO activity, almost like the flashes are doing something to the minds of the people that are witnessing it. And now, I don't know if this is paralyzing them. I don't know if this is putting them into an altered state. You know, I start thinking about what was that device that uh, Anthony Peake was describing with the the weird device. Oh, the Lucia light device. The Lucia light device, yeah. Puts you in an altered state of consciousness. Puts you in an altered state of consciousness. Is that? And this is something, again, you know, talking about recurring themes that seems like back in the 1950s, this was happening to people. It was happening now in the 1996. It's happened more recently. People describe these flashes. Is it simply that it's some effect of the craft or is there something to it? Is there some mechanism behind that flash which is deliberately designed to incapacitate people? So going back to uh, what was occurring here, so they drive to this little local village and they pick up you know, a pot of coffee or whatever they need and they start driving back. But when they start driving back home, they've got the attention of the craft. What happened was this object raced from a vantage point in the sky, screamed over their car and the young son who was, who was in the car actually felt it, it was going to crash into the car and he became very alarmed. He started to cry and it, it, didn't, it just screamed over the car and went away. So they went to the house and they said to the young daughter, there was, the, the, there was a teenage daughter there who belonged to the other woman who was in the car. Yeah. As I said, there was two women in the car and a young son. Yeah. They came back and they said to the daughter who was in the house, you'll never guess what we just saw. What was that? A UFO? And, and this daughter refused to believe them. So the daughter says, okay, let me come back out with you. And if that object is still in the sky, then I'll see it myself. So she came into the car, and on the way back, in between where the sighting was, they saw a range of trees just down, slightly off the road, down farmer's fields, a grouped range of trees, and coming up from these trees were columns of light. It was like a Second World War searchlight, you know, the the searchlights that used to illuminate the the German bombers. 
red, green, blue lights, tubular lights coming up from this forest. It's the ground team. Well, I'm wondering, but you, you actually kind of onto something there. It's like, because this is different colored lights. Previously, you had the craft with lights coming down. Now you've got lights coming up. What the hell is occurring here? So they, they watched this, but because the, the sun was so, I think it was Paul, was so freaked out, there was something, but Paul was exposed to flashes of some kind. So what, because he says there in the audio that, oh, it was because, um, you know, he thought it was going to crash into them. That was part of it, but it was also because these flashes, something seemingly um, had altered his feeling about what's going on. And we hear this commonly with people that have these experiences, that for whatever reason, it's like this natural instinct kicks in when you know that there's danger near, mm. that there's something that's not not good going on here. So they drive home. When they drive home, uh, they get back to this little hut, this little farmhouse, and Susan's there. And of course, I don't know how old she is, but I believe she's a teenage girl. And they start describing their experiences to her. And they start saying what they had seen. And she does, as he points out, she doesn't believe them. Like there's just no belief. But what we find out later on, apparently, is that uh, one of them ended up seeing, I don't know which occupant it was, but they ended up seeing this being standing at the door. Now, when they do like a double take, it's gone. Like it's instantly gone, but it's kind of peeking around the corner and it does have the impression of it being a gray like being. So the phenomenon in its contagious form has followed them home. So this is all too much for them, right? This is just so overwhelming for what's going on. And she's like, okay, we have to go out. We have to go out and check what's going on. So the four of them get back into the vehicle and they head out back to this location where they'd seen it. Now, coincidentally, For whatever reason, when they'd gone to buy the pot of coffee because of what they'd just seen, they looked through the store and they found a UFO magazine. They pulled out this UFO magazine and they called the hotline after they've had this activity going on back at their home. This UFO hotline, they get in contact with a researcher and a researcher's like, get a pair of binoculars, go back to the site, go and see what you can see. Now they've calmed down and like, yeah, okay, we'll go. A bit more rational now. They didn't have any binoculars, but it just so happens that they had a family member that was nearby that happened to just come to them. And he was like, oh, here, borrow my binoculars. So they do. And they go back to the site. Now they get right on the edge. They get right on the edge and they can see that there's something going on. There's some type of activity taking place. I'll let Malcolm describe what they see when they go back. Things happen. Now, what they saw then, Chris, was that they claim that in some blue bubbles, there like were spheres. like spheres, yes, there were one to two of these gray beings standing motionless in these spheres and being propelled or blown across this farmer's field towards their direction. And at this point, the daughter turned and looked at the side of the car and she said there was a small grey being standing at the car looking in. So that's what that image was I had on the screen. You can see the the, the sketch of them in the bubbles. But do, see, but do you see in this particular sketch that you've included here? So you have this triangular shaped craft, which apparently is landed in a field, and around it, they're not trees, they're greys. There are some trees there, but the rest of them are those little. What? They're, really? They're grey. So listen to this, right? <laughs> so apparently they watched for several moments as they were completely shocked to see humanoid figures that had come into view. They were slightly smaller than the first one, and it appeared that there was a larger one that was directing or guiding them, instructing them on what they were to do, right? They continued to move, picking up some kind of box or cylinder from the ground, and they were carrying them into the woods, into the black structured shape that was glowing near the trees. They pick. What are they? Where are these box? Did some Their UFO equipment. fly over and then drop a bunch of boxes and cylinders? Dude, I've got a giant box coming up in plus as well. <laughs> oh, I bet you do. Mm? <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> I bet you it's probably moldy as well. So when they were uh, out picking up these objects, right, they're seeing this kind of stuff. This is is horrifying, right, because no one really understands. And, of course, as you heard in the audio there from Malcolm, they've jumped back in the car. Mm. uh, They're all freaked out. Now, something that Malcolm didn't describe because the audio was quite terrible before we cleaned it up, so I didn't include it. Um, But Malcolm said that as they'd driven to this location where this weird logistical operation with cargo was taking place, He says that there was all of a sudden these stars, like these weird stars, like twinkly white blue lights that were just all hanging around in the field and the air. And they kind of drove through them. It was like this weird kind of thing. And it kind of moved around the vehicle. Uh, It was almost like the atmosphere was being manipulated around Mm. them. Their perceptions were being altered. But this is what they're seeing. Now, of course, when they see these greys come up to their vehicle, see, he says there that it was like um, spheroid kind of vehicles, if you will, bubbles that they were moving around in. 
In the book, it actually says that at first they thought they were weird moving haystacks. Like they look like haystacks that were being manipulated. So it's like sagebrush yeah. floating around. Yeah, until they realized that there were these greys inside these weird bubbles that were heading. So they got the hell out of there. They got the hell out of there and they, they drove out. Uh, they ended up calling the telephone number of Sky Search, which was like um, one of these UFO reporting agencies. Uh, it just so happened they spoke to Larry Dean, uh, who later on investigated this as well and looked into it in, in greater detail. Um, but they're, they're truly shocked. Like They do not understand what's occurring with this particular incident. And we find that it's now about 11.30 p.m. that this is happening. Now, we know that this started around 8. Uh, there's been a lot of activity going on, but it's almost like there's something like missing time occurring here. We're not entirely sure. But guess what stands out about this, about this particular case is that uh, not only does it have uh, these weird creatures that are, I mean, clearly they're greys, but they're just a little bit off. The tall being Mary described later on, she said it actually had brown skin that glowed slightly orange. This was the one that was directing the other beings in almost a robotic fashion to perform whatever duties they were doing. Jane also said there was a strange mist that was actually emerging from the trees, almost like this uh, mist was being utilized to camouflage their activities. But it wasn't a mist, right? It was some kind of fibrous material. And this fibrous material is what started to form those cocoons, these haystacks, which then formed into the bubbles. The mist was being emanated from the craft and then was being utilized by the greys. Sounds like ectoplasm or something. It's really... So I looked into this because I'm like, this is crazy. Like, this is really crazy. John Keel looked into this with the whole hoax stuff, right? So, and Amy Michelle as well. So one of the big things that stands out about UFO sightings where people claim to have evidence, and it, it's many cases... Too many, in fact, to list here. But these cases, you have the uh, the, the material known as angel hair mm. left behind. You know, or it's angel fibrous too, it's, isn't it? Yeah, it's fibrous, right? And it's, it's obviously comes in different forms, different formats. Um, sometimes it's like a gelatinous goop that's left behind. Sometimes it's coloured. A lot of the time, it's clear. Um, and look, the thing is, that, yeah, it could be people have gone. Well, it's spiders' webs, and we have that here in Australia. We have the migration of spiders, and it just leaves you know huge amounts of this mm. stuff lying around. Um, but it's never the same as this, right? This what fits into the deliberate deception that's being being left by UFOs because the stuff that's left behind, it's not spider's web. Like it's the stuff that's been analyzed that we've found. But most of the time when people collect samples of this stuff, it just evaporates. It just disappears, right? It's some kind of nanotechnology. No, it's not nanotechnology. It's like some type of weird. Um... So one eyewitness described this stuff falling. Right, so this stuff, like he said, a UFO flew over the top of him. It basically expelled a mass of this stuff, like it was like streamers coming out the back, and all this stuff fell over him. But he said when it fell on his skin, it was like all over his skin, but it wasn't on his jacket. And I think it was, it was either Keel or Michelle, but they said that when they, um, you know, dug a little bit deeper into it, uh, very rapidly the stuff evaporated, right? But it was because of the difference in the like the the uh, heat that was being put out. So the heat that was on his body was obviously retaining it for longer, whereas on his jacket, because his jacket was cooler on the outside, it just evaporated. And as soon as it got colder, this stuff evaporated and disappeared, leaving them with no proof, nothing left behind whatsoever. Yet He'll- in the sighting that's described, it's forming into these- Haystacks. Balls. These that balls. They're being transported yeah. in. Yeah, it's it's really, really strange. And this is what's happening in the, the reports of France in the 1950s, this fibrous material- was being left behind, but no one kept any samples. Some of the outlying cases are kind of strange, though. There are reports out there of people getting hold of what is allegedly angel hair or some type of fibrous material left behind by UFOs, and they put it into a like a mason jar or something like that. And as long as it's in the jar, it's okay. But then they take it to like a UFO reporting organization or they you know go to take it to local authorities. They even keep it in the jar until they get it to a lab. And this has been witnessed. The moment it's open, it's like, pfft, it's gone. It was in there. People could see it, like it was clear, it was transparent, and yet the moment that it hits air, it just evaporates. It's part of this, uh, I think, this deception that John Keel was onto, that it's deliberately done to deceive people. And John Keel, you know, further emphasizes this. He's like, look, people are given rocks and told that they're special, important rocks, and then when they have the rocks analyzed, they find that it's just a piece of regular rock that you can get from anywhere. Um, you've got the the, Lon, the Lonnie Zamora case of the craft that landed outside uh, Sirocco, New Mexico. That happened on the 24th of April in 1964. Uh, it left behind a metal-like material uh, that was analyzed. It was proven to be silicon, like a standard kind of substance. Right. Uh, he says, look, silicon substances have been found frequently at sites, but sometimes it's mixed with just a slight uh, other amount of chemicals. So whether or not it's aluminium or 
It's, it's just always a little bit off. Uh, he says, look, there were witnesses in Tex- uh, Texas and in Maryland who claimed that they saw shiny discs explode in the air in June of 1965. Uh, pieces were recovered from it. It was analyzed at the, Good- uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center. It was ordinary ferrochromium. You can get it from anywhere. So why are, why are people seeing this? Then there was a report from Chiba in Japan, 1956, where people said that a circular craft flew over. This was witnessed by hundreds, if not thousands of people. They all saw this. They said this craft flew over. Uh, it flew over their city. It eject- ejected a mass, a flood of shreds that appeared to be like chaff that were all over the ground. Witnesses picked them up and very rapidly they disappeared. Although John Keel says, look, I have collected some of these samples from eyewitnesses that have, you know, especially in the cases from 1967. He says these strips are identical, almost identical, to chaff that is dispensed by high flying Air Force planes to jam radar. Yet they don't appear to be Air Force standard issue, but they're just a little bit off. So he's suggesting it might be the same purpose. Yeah, exactly. But this is the thing, right? He says, look, the UFO chaff is often found under trees and on porches in places where they could not possibly have fallen from the sky directly. Hmm. So what happened with this Falkland case? Because you've got a couple more videos. Oh, so with going back to the Falkland case, right? So this is where it becomes even odd, like odder. Because, it again, it has all these elements in it that seem to be just a standard case, like the UFO phenomenon follows them home, mm-hmm. they start seeing creatures in their homes, that kind of stuff. But then it's just a little bit off when you have, uh, look into it in greater detail, the sun, right? So the sun, uh, there were a couple of incidents that took place, but it just so happened that the mother, much later on in this farmhouse, was talking on the phone to a UFO researcher. Is, just, this, is this number no, nine? Yeah, this is number nine. It's not, it's not mentioned yet, but basically uh, she's talking on the, she just happens to be talking to a, a UFO researcher. The son is upstairs pouring a bath. Hmm. Listen to what happens. The mother had uh, run a bath for her son. He was upstairs. She had run a bath and she was down the stair on the phone. And then suddenly she heard, Mom, Mom, come quick, come quick, come quick. She threw the phone down, bounded up the stairs, rushed into the, the, the bathroom and says, What's the matter? And the young our son was uncontrollably crying, sobbing, and he said he saw a small grey being standing next yes. to the bath. He had just appeared next to the bath. Now the difference, Chris, the difference with this case is this being had a, a jagged row of teeth. Now as a researcher you, yourself, I'm sure you're well aware of these grey creatures. They yes. generally don't have that. No, they don't. They usually have very, very... In, um, you know, unmoving, very, yes. very narrow slits. That's correct. And this is why this was bizarre. And I, I began to think maybe maybe this can't be true until a, a colleague of mine in Scotland gave me some uh, press clippings from Mexico and also uh, Puerto Rico yes. in which greys have been seen. And these accounts had the jagged teeth. Now, I don't suppose this young son's reading newspapers from Puerto Rico together. Excellent point. Do Demonic. You s- do you see? The, well, I'm not even going down the path Kill of, of demons. Do you see the deception here, though? He, as a seasoned researcher, goes, "Oh, maybe it's not real." Like, and it was only coincidentally that he received reports from other researchers saying that they had had reports of people encountering greys with weird, sharpened teeth. That he's like, "Maybe it is real." It's like the phenomenon deliberately inserts elements. It shows itself to people. In this case, it shows itself to the sun. Because what I found out in this case as well, which is not included in the audio here, is that the sun previously as well, once again, when there was a witness, he was uh, apparently the mother had some friend come over and then he had a friend, like a, she had a, a son who was there as well. They're looking out the window. There is this odd white, pasty white man, like a weird shaped gray. I mean, grays are already weird shaped, but even weirder shaped gray just like hovering outside the window, not even paying attention to them, but just hovering around, showing itself to them. And of course, it has these weird jagged teeth. And when they scream out, the thing just disappears right before them. So this stuff is just odd. And it's part of this wider deception that's going on. Um, The last thing I'll include from here as well is that uh, Malcolm Robinson points out that, look, this farmhouse, after this, it just had uh, just a huge amount of strange activity taking place. It doesn't make sense. uh, That farmhouse where this couple lived had seen a lot of UFO activity. On one occasion, the mother was looking out. It's like a valley. She was looking out the top bedroom window, just looking out, just looking at the rolling fields. And then suddenly, she had that droning noise, looked up, and it was like a massive thing, like something out like of Close Encounters of the Third Kind. 
a big object just slowly came across the top of a roof and she looked up and she, she could see boxes and pipes and appendages. It was like an airfix model, if you remember, mm. when we were younger, because, you know, all the, all the components. And the undersend is just slowly with one blinking red light and flew away off. It's like it's presenting itself to them but it's adding these weird elements it wasn't just a standard craft that was so it's not over. like this image it's not like that, that i had image. on the no. screen where it's just a black triangle no, it's like he's describing pipes and the weird steampunk p- ufo <laughs> flying but what is this similar to this is similar to going all the way back to the dirigible the airships mm. of what's going on it's like i think that the great researchers were onto something here that this is done deliberately as a deception to grab people's attention did you get into what happened to susan no. There's an image her, here of her with these bruises on her shoulder. Uh, like she's been grabbed by something. Yeah, I think so. Where what? Let me just look at my notes here. Uh, I think that they recalled later on that there was some type of uh, incident of missing time that happened in in the craft. Oh, sorry, while they were in the car. Uh, but the exact details, I wasn't entirely sure. I think it was the the younger daughter, from what I recall, said that she had heard these beings communicating by making odd noises, like they were making kind of weird high-pitched whining kind of noises. Um, but she was absolutely considerate. Like, she was sure that there was some grey that was looking in the window, but it was grinning at her. So these things, like, the greys don't grin. They normally don't grin. They don't have these big smiles about them. Yeah, that's uh, pretty odd. That's and, and, way outside the pattern. Yeah, and you're right. Uh, it's got it here. Susan did discover a strange mark on her shoulder. Uh, but this is odd. It was as if blood had been sucked through her skin. There was no incision or needle puncture mark or anything like that. Vampire grace confirmed. Well, Jane Load also- them up into the cannon, shoot them into the sun. That's a really good idea. Jane also, well, just get UFOs and push them out of the Atlantic. Yep. You know, that's And the Alien Hate League with the right funding. Yep. But we'll we be able to that. build this giant cannon. That's actually a really good idea. So Jane also discovered marks on her body as well that weren't there before. But this then ties into, you know, are they having genuine experiences or is it because one of them said that they had seen something that she went looking for it? But she did. She said she found uh, a mark on her right butt, um, on her right breast and also under the rib and a strange mark on her shoulder as well. So there's, there is something weird that is going on in these reports. But, but what it is, it's deliberately remaining elusive. And so, well, I mean, you get the same kind of reports in possession cases, demonic attacks. Yes. Again, the crossovers are pretty evident. Well, they're, they're, it's pretty these astounding. Demonic looking beings showing up. And it's almost like it needs to, and I think this is what is more likely of what's going on. It's revealing itself. It's giving us pieces of the puzzle. It never gives us the full picture. Like we're, we're trying to put it together when we've got, you know, two pieces of a 10,000 piece jigsaw puzzle and we don't even know what it is. Like that's just how difficult this thing is. Um, but I think there's also another possibility that whatever this stuff is, uh, it needs us to sustain itself. So it deliberately does interact with us. It causes us to talk about it. It talk, causes us to have, you know, fear, or whatever else, but it's just enough mm. to keep itself hidden, but going along. Uh, you know, and John Keel points out, look, you know, there's been reports throughout history of where people have completely dismissed it and said that the person is crazy. A great example is that we know that old case of the, I think it was the Simonston uh, report of where a farmer, he claims that some UFO, you know, landed in his field and the, the window opened and a couple of alien humanoid kind of looking beings stepped out like we need water for our craft. So he gave them water and in response, they gave him, they gave him pancakes. Pancakes, yeah. Right? But when he ate the and pancakes, blah, 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 blah. yeah, it was like cardboard. It <laughs> yeah. was just like, he's like, they took a, so these card, these uh, cardboard pancakes were taken away and were analyzed, right? And it was founded like this is just standard buckwheat. Like there was just nothing spectacular. Yeah, they just weren't very good chefs. And so this guy was just just like ridiculed. It was like he's made it up. Like he actually went to this effort of cooking some, you know, but it was, it was odd. It wasn't like a standard pancake either. It's like, if you're going to claim that you're given pancakes, first of all, it's kind of a silly thing to hoax. Like, it's just, it's strange. And secondly, <laughs> why wouldn't you just use a standard pancake? Like, but the thing about that case is what Keel points out, despite the fact that people are like, this guy's insane, he's made it up, it's a hoax. It just so happened that uh, weeks later, uh, another witness who had reported it, I think they were a police officer, had recorded it at the time, came forward to show that they had seen something hovering over that area as well. So there'd been, and this is what was occurring in the French cases. In so many of the French cases, did he get crappy pancakes as well? No, he just saw a craft, right? But in so many of these French cases, it's like people see these craft. They behave in odd fashion. They get weird encounters. Mm. Uh, a really great example is where uh, I think it, in October of um, twenty, uh, sorry, nineteen fifty-four, this UFO landed in some guy's field, and no one was going to believe him. Like it was just strange. He went out, it spooked his cows, and it was all kind of weird. 
Um, but it left behind this, what was known as the impossible hole, right? And people were like, what's the impossible hole? It just sounds, it almost sounds filthy. I've got an impossible oh, hole. Oh, I'm sure you do. Coming I know. up in the plus extension. I know you've given me some insight to some of the stories you're going to be covering. <laughs> yes. But with this, but the reason why it was called the impossible hole is like, I feel like, oh, he's making it up. It's a hoax. But they went and inspected this hole. There was this extremely deep four yard wide hole that was on his property. But what happened was it actually went down in this perfect circle and then it was actually bigger on the inside. Like it splayed out. What? Like something had opened up and had separated it on what the inside. The? And it kind of had this weird like cone effect on the inside. But how does that work? Well, also, how does it work that you don't damage any of the roots of any of the grass or, or the, the plant materials? Oh. That it, none of the roots were, all the roots were fine. It was almost like some weird thing. Like an energy force. An energy down. had dematerialized the soil. And nothing else. All the roots were some intact. kind of space mole. Yes, I don't know, but there was no burns. There was I mean, <laughs> probably highly unlikely to be space moles. Maybe an energy mole of some kind. Um, but this was enough proof. Like, and the other thing was is that around this particular hole, there was like uh, I think it was either square or triangular indentations in the ground mm. uh, that were in a geometric pattern. Mm-hmm. So if this guy's hoaxing it, look, I get it. Just a plate of shitty pancakes. <laughs> yeah, that's just left behind at the bottom. You get all the way down. It's just crap pancakes. Um, no, <laughs> that's but- part of the high strangeness. I mean, it's a French case. The French is uh, the French are the masters of cuisine. So of course you have an alien encounter and they serve up the most bland tasting <laughs> yeah, pancakes yeah, you could ever that, imagine. You're right. It does kind of it it fit it seems to meld to the culture. You make a really good point there. Uh, I mean, like the Maury Island case is a really good example as well of the whole negative factors thing. Like we know the Maury Island case of where that weird slag was reported to be ejected from a craft in 1947. That was analyzed. It was found to be calcium, silicon, iron, zinc, aluminium, other trace elements. And what's this Dan? Oh, regression okay. stuff you've got here as well. So you've got another five videos. I do. So let me, these are very short, but I wanted to to raise this as well because this actually fits into the whole uh, flash scenario of of what was going on, of where people we're definitely interacting with something that presents itself as a grey. I don't know why it's chosen this form, and maybe it is a species, but it seems like there's something more to it. But this is the the story of the um, Aaron's family, A H R E N S family. Uh, this consisted of Dan, Joyce, uh, and their, their their two kids. And there was Dan Jr., Danny, and their daughter, uh, Heather. So I believe Heather was about one year old at the time or one year old at the time, and Danny was three. Um, but this family, essentially, they had um, gone to bed one evening. Heather was in their room in her cot, uh, and something very strange happened. Now, look, I'm sorry about the the sound of the audio, but I think it's better if they describe it. I've pulled this from Cleaned an it old- up a little bit. Yeah, it's from an old sightings uh, television program. It was uh, republished by Eyes on Cinema that do, you know, repost these really great videos. But let's just have a listen to Dan describing what happened that evening. This gigantic monster that I- Actually, no, stop for one second. I'm sorry. That the dream had this dark- I can't find it. <laughs> Sorry, I should point out, right, that Dan's in a moment. This is Heather as she's grown up. This is Heather describing this. Now, Heather didn't necessarily know what had happened. On this particular evening, um, there was a blast of red light, much like the French reports of it being some type of red that was being seen. There was this blast of red light through their window, and they were paralyzed and terrified, but don't recall anything else happening. Although they had some type of knowing like inside them, perhaps a repressed memory that something had taken place. Heather, as she grew up, had this recurring nightmare all throughout her life and this kind of memory that was coming through. And as her parents, that they didn't guide her. They didn't, weren't telling her about you know what that experienced. But Heather herself was describing what she was seeing and these strange repressed dreams and memories that were coming back. There was this gigantic monster that I can't really explain because the dream had this dark focus to it. But I remembered looking into this eye and seeing my own reflection. This is a picture of the monster that Heather drew when she was 11 years old. Before the her family even knew what alien abduction <laughs> was. And before the publication of Communion. So this is important, right? Because one of the arguments that's put forward is that, look, Communion, uh, once it was out there, mm. a whole heap of people just jumped on the bandwagon and said, that's what I'm seeing. Not the other way around. Not that people have been experiencing these beings and Whitley Street was the first one to bring it to attention. What I, I do speculate, I don't, think entirely this is the case. I do wonder though, if communion itself, and I'm not, I, I, it's still, I think it occurred, right? But I wonder if this was deliberately orchestrated by the intelligence to create a new hoax factor. So up until this point, right, with everything's been going on, when people are contactees, whatever else, they've been given rocks and 
crappy newspaper and nothing, no, nothing tangible, right? And they were discredited. People are like, well, you know, investigators, I can't prove that anything happened because there's nothing left behind. It's, uh, it's a hoax. It's garbage. Now you've got communion comes along. All these people start going, oh my God, like I've, I've seen these beings. Mm. What is it? It's a hoax factor. It's one of these negative factors because people can go, skeptics can say, you're just recalling a memory from seeing communion or you're just recalling it from the book or you're hoaxing it because that's what it is. This is before communion, well before it. So what are people experiencing here? So Dan describes a trigger of what happened. Once again, he was watching a movie. The movie that he was watching was communion. A movie came on that had a scene in it where this little alien peeked around from behind a doorway. Dan was watching the movie version of Communion. I, I just burst into tears when I'd seen these piercing. God, I don't like. Oh, it's so creepy. Door. Uh, a very split second in my mind, uh, I, I got more or less a flashback of what had happened back in 1976. I remember seeing that in high school. Of the thing, it was like that little blue being thing, wasn't it? No, you know how you have those, it's like the Sunday night movie when we were growing up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Channel 9 or something had the Sunday night movie because we only had five channels. Yeah. Uh, and then the next day at school, I remember the next day at school, just everyone was talking about that scene. Yeah. With yeah. that ho- horrible, hideous gray face coming from behind the doorway. It is absolutely terrifying. Do you know what did it for me? Yeah, I was too late for that. I was, for whatever reason, I never saw that on TV and I and I kind of avoided it. For me, what really just caused me not to be able to sleep for a long time and like put this stuff in my head was signs when they're at that party and then the alien walks past outside. Mm. For whatever reason, that was like, that's it, I'm out. Like, it's done. Yeah. I, I, I can't handle it. You're right, though. I mean, communion, not not even the film, but the book itself, you well, the hear cover. that time and time again. Yeah, people just need to see the cover and- there's a moment of recognition. Uh, so that being some kind of orchestrated event, I don't see how that works in their favor because it really exposed the activity on a large scale. Well, you're right. You're right. It, it would for people that are in the know, right? But overall, once communion came out and people are saying, I've seen this, what's the easiest thing that a skeptic can say? They can say, you've read communion. Yeah, but prior, I mean, if that wasn't the case and people came out with all sorts of different descriptions of and there was no commonality linking them at all, that would be an even stronger case for the skeptics. At least when people are saying, I've seen the same thing, there is some pattern, there is some recognition, and people, you can start to see that they're describing the same essential program yeah, look, that we've, we've heard time and time again. You see what I'm saying, right, though? The, the thing, you're totally right, but what I am also saying is that it actually functions much like the rocks and the crap that's been given to people before. It still functions as, and I'm not saying that there's any you know, um, I guess, logical way that it's going to work, but it does function as one of these negative factors. It's always going to be a negative factor. It's a positive factor and that, yes, it has exposed them, but it also now has a negative factor. What What is the negative factor so this precisely? Is what, this is what John Keel described. It is deliberate deception that's put about. So it's like people that are given, you know, have incredible experiences and they are given something that proves their experience, but the moment that it's analyzed, it's found to be fake or it's found to be something that's yeah i mean this is i get what you're saying but this is a little bit different because this isn't something left behind that can be analyzed this is eyewitness testimony of people seeing the same thing yeah but this is i think it works exactly the same way because it it creates this greater scene now oh and it's true like if you go out and you talk to someone who's not interested in these topics and you mention that you've seen a gray a lot of people will be like oh that's from that communion thing yeah, well, well, it's become even more than that. I mean, it's just a pop culture icon. And look what's happened. Exactly. So now, you're totally right. It has now permeated all throughout pop culture. So rather than before, and especially like in these French cases, it's a really good example of these French cases, right? These people don't have the internet. Yes, they have radio. They don't have television. Uh, these things aren't being reported that widely. Yes, they have newspapers, but newspapers are being very careful in what they're reporting. You have people that are not connected to each other reporting the same stuff. Right, so that that I think is like this verification that something really is going on, something strange is occurring. Today, right at the like, communion comes out right, really at the birth of the explosion of social media and like the the generation of social media. All of a sudden, now the entirety of the the phenomenon is debunked because it's like it's popular culture. Do you see what it is? It's like this mechanism that allows itself to remain 
reclusive. It allows itself to remain hidden, to hide under this veneer of, well, yeah, maybe you did see it, but it's the X-Files. It's all these television shows. Yeah, I get what you're saying. I understand the logic. I I don't think there'd be any um, intent behind that because time and time again, we've seen that these entities don't really care about what human beings perceive about them to a certain degree. mm -hmm. They have their operation mission. They have their mission. And they just do it. I, <laughs> they don't really well, care. This is something that was described actually by, I, th- I think it was Susan from Oracle. I didn't include it in my notes because it wasn't that important, but it's important now. She said that when she saw these beings, um, she said she got the impression or the feeling that they were just irritated because that was their job that they had to do. It was like it was just a, a job, like there was no thought. So I wonder if there are a certain arms or elements that are maybe higher up that are deliberately kind of doing this stuff. And you know what? Going back to the French cases, I forgot to mention it. So in the French cases in 1954, uh, much like the report from 1996 in Scotland, there was a farmer who claims that there was a, uh, he was looking at his farmhouse window, uh, craft landed, a bunch of robot-like beings climbed out of it and were being instructed by a taller being. It's this recurring theme. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, this is, and this is the 1950s that this guy's reporting this. There's nothing in pop culture that he's seen to experience. So, what happened to Dan? I presume he got her horrifically well, raped by these entities. Dan. Which is pretty much the pattern. It's, it's number, uh, yeah, number three is because he goes off. Uh, oh, I think sure, it, sure. he gets a regression with John Carpenter. Take a good so, it's, yeah, so hypnotic audio. It looks metal. It looks like a. It's metal. It looks like a little spade. It's going to hurt. So he's hurt? about to get probed. You see it. He put it in me. Oh, I really didn't want to tell anybody uh, whatsoever. My own family, I didn't want to tell. I wouldn't even discuss it with, with Joyce. But after Dan returned from his second hypnosis session, that all changed. It wasn't too long after the second session that Joyce started remembering. The conscious memories just came. I mean, they just came back. There wasn't anything that I could do to stop them from coming back. So this was strange as well. So he you know, gets freaked out. He has a panic attack. I haven't included this in the audio, but he basically had a panic attack is what set all this stuff off. And he went is this the old documentary where he's screaming? No, it's a different one. Okay. Um, but he goes and he, he goes and gets checked out. They can't find anything wrong with him. And obviously when he goes to the regression, we realize that it was this particular incident, this flash of red that took place. But his stuff had to come back through a trigger event, which was communion. His wife, Joyce, it just spontaneously came back after he came home. Mm. So I'm like, look, from a skeptical standpoint, is it that he came home, started talking about aliens, and she's like, hey, that sounds like it's pretty cool. And I'm like, <laughs> maybe that's a possibility. But the fact that the kids, right, the kids are reporting something, although Danny Jr. isn't reporting anything yet, but Heather was. Heather has his memories. So let me just recall, like, play you um, him describing how he recalls the events after he'd had the regression. Under hypnosis, I actually seen what had happened to us that night. I was cowering in the corner of the bed, uh, scared to death. There was a little being at the foot of the bed, and there was one uh, with my wife, and there was one at the crib at the end of the bed with my daughter. There were three of them, and one of them touched my arm, and I sat up on the bed. I watched him take Heather. When they were taking her, the, the feeling that I had was so overwhelming as far as the helpless feeling that I had that I, I just couldn't hardly, couldn't hardly stand it. That was the most got, got off feeling <laughs> because they're in such control of you, you can't do it. Yeah, that's a normal reaction. Yeah, this is the thing. If she was faking this, her reaction's pretty genuine. Although in, in watching that, Right. I mean, clearly it is traumatic. I mean, maybe people can be good actors. Um, it, it reminds me of what years ago, though, of what um, Greg Newkirk told us. So when Greg Newkirk was out doing his whole Planet Weird stuff, he told us that he got Gao. Remember Gao? And uh, they were going and they went and did a hypnotic regression, but they did the hypnotic regression with inserting a, uh, a memory, I think it was. Like it was a, hip, like a hypnotic uh, abduction memory. And he never spoke about it. Like he never, he never put it out there. But Greg told us that it, it fucked him up. Like it really, it was a false memory that was put in, but it really caused a huge amount of trouble. So if this is stuff is like hypnosis going on, there is a possibility that you can have, and keeping that kind of idea in mind, 
that maybe false memories can generate these genuine reactions that that she's having, but mm. I think it's more than that in the circumstance. I think if it was just one case and you just had this one oddball case where these people were describing these beings with the same marks, the same modus operandi, the same um, goals that they seem to have, then you would think, yeah, mm. implanted memory, whatever, these people are quacks. But like we've said time and time again, this activity has been seen all across the world. The stories, the pattern is very, very, very similar. Well, where for me, uh, the balance of proof comes through that I think that something is happening is that uh, you've got Danny, who was Dan Jr. So he was one when this when this took place. Mm-hmm. No, I'm sorry. He was three when this took place. Um, as he became, as he grew up and his parents started talking about this stuff, he was still like, nope, nope nothing happened. You know, I don't have anything to do with that. Um but then, for whatever reason, stuff started coming through, and so because stuff came through, he went for a regression, and this is the regression. Danny was three on the night his parents believed the family was first abducted by alien forces. He has no memory of that night, but ever since then, Danny has had a recurring dream about a strange figure threatening his family. John Carpenter believes that this recurring dream should be explored in Danny's first hypnosis session. Let's come right on in. I hear a noise. What does it sound like? Like a can dropping. And where does that sound seem to come from? The garage. Something's in the garage. Uh Uh-huh. What do you feel at this point? There's two of them standing there. Mm Mm-hmm. Real tall. Long fingers. Big head. Big head. Yeah. Yeah. And dark eyes. Dark eyes. Here they come. And what does it remind you of? Like a stick. Like a stick. Shiny. Shiny stick. What did it remind you of? Like a wand. It's making it move and throw. And does it seem to do anything? Just in the back of my head. Uh huh. What does it feel like? It hurts. It's a hurt. He's really sweaty. Yeah. <laughs> He's having a genuine physiological reaction, I believe, to this. And one of the things that and even you and I have, you know, um, looked at over the years with regression hypnosis is that, well, is the person being led, uh, uh, you know, certain memories or um, are they being coaxed, you know, in a certain way? In that particular regression, you know, that's apparently that's the first regression that's taken place. Uh, it's being done in front of his family. It's being filmed by that film crew. It doesn't appear to be, from what I can see in there, there doesn't appear to be any types of hoaxing or leading leading questions. Yeah, I mean, obviously it's heavily edited, but there weren't really leading questions. Yeah. And so, again, it just matches the pattern that absolutely we've seen well, everywhere. And, and what comes out later on, we find from from the parents, is they say, well, um, with, with Danny, when he was a kid, he would just disappear. Like he would just disappear and then they would go looking for him and they'd find him in strange places in the house where you wouldn't expect him to be. And I'm like, that's terrifying. I mean, that's something that, that Joyce said. Now, these things, they can take your kids and there's nothing that you can do about it. Like, this is how dangerous this kind of stuff is. So, look, my, my point is with this stuff, and I'll, I'll leave it with the great words of John Keel. He said, look, innumerable cases of contact and landings have been flushed down the ufological drain because of the deliberate negative factor. Sincere witnesses have actually been ruined because of uh, amateur UFO investigators accusing them of being liars or worse. And I think that's still going on. I think there is this fight now between, of course, there are hoaxes out there, right? There are plenty of people that make up stories. There's a whole heap of lunatics out there. But the thing is, it's this cyclic pattern where I feel like nothing is going to change because it deliberately undermines those people that have had genuine encounters. That's how clever this intelligence is. And uh, intelligence is. And as much as we try to do things like reveal the program or, you know, we've got whistleblowers coming forward with their experiences it's going to continue doing what it wants to do, and we're never going to find the answers. God help us from the demonic alien grace. Mm-hmm. But coming up in the plus extension, it turns out Rebecca Renfro 
might be a grey apologist. Oh no! And we oh, learn always grey apologists. We learn that uh, it's not really their fault. The greys have been kind of hard Are done they by following orders. They've been hard done by. And uh, there is a bit of an interspecies, uh, intergalactic war going on that we're totally uh, unaware of. Is it the reptilians? And who is her uncle? <laughs> that is the important who question. Who is this weird guy? Everyone thinks he's a drunk. He carries around this brown paper bag. Everyone thinks there's a bottle in there. People, the, the adults all seem to see a bottle of alcohol, but not Rebecca. He brings out some kind of strange metallic artifact. Is it the same wand that was used on Dan? Well, no, it, it seems to trigger some kind of Stargate portal in her backyard. <laughs> because that's the best way to go through a Stargate portal is through your backyard. And when she goes through, as I described, it is really like the cantina bar and more. There is uh, military guys in there. There's weird greys. There's all sorts of other alien species. You don't have to sell it. I'm in. Some wild stuff coming up in plus. Don't take your meds for the plus extension. Sign up today. Head head to mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash plus. Gets you access to these big extensions we do every single Friday. And of course, if you sign up, you get exclusive access to our shows that come out every single Tuesday as well. You're getting more than double the content when you sign up for Plus. Plus members also get a higher quality audio version of the show, a totally ad-free version of the show as well. And if you sign up for MU Max, you get access to our entire back catalogue going back uh, decades now. Mysteriousuniverse.org forward slash Plus has all the details. Sign up today. It helps support your favorite show. That's a wrap for this free edition of MU. If you're on Plus, do not miss the craziness coming up after the break for everyone else. Thanks for listening, and uh, we'll catch you next week. (laughs) 